Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Chef AJ here, episode 26 of Weight Age Loss Causes. Wednesday. Ooh, apologize, we did not broadcast last week. I, ha I wasn't sick, I had laryngitis. So, all right. Before we get started, I want to tell you about some exciting things. Instant Pot has come out with two new models the Ultra 60. And Is that the six quart? These are, I think they're six or 6.3, and the Duo Plus 60. Why wow. these are different, I don't know yet. I just got them, so I'm going to play with them, and then I'll shoot some videos. But in the meantime, if you don't have an Instant Pot, get one. www.instantpot.com. $50 off with code AJ. My favorite so far is the 8 quart, but I haven't tried these new ones yet, so I'm going to let you know. And before we get started, I want to thank Nancy from Texas for sending me these Nancy awesome stickers. stickers. They're vegetables. They're fruits and vegetables. I love these. Thank you. We often do sticker challenges. Can you scratch and sniff? Class program. I don't know if it, they, they're just so cute. So thank you. That's the perfect gift. All right. You ready, Mr. Kenny? We, we got some questions watching. and the questions are... Already we've got questions before well, we no. start? No. Someone's right. from Costa Rica and okay. Salem, Oregon. Nice. All right. So here we go. Hey everybody, I'm Chef AJ and welcome to episode 26 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent and sustainable weight loss. You're welcome to ask questions live. Kenny does his best but the feed goes fast so the best way to submit a question is to sign up to be on my mailing list at www.eatonprocess.com. And we'll answer it next time. Absolutely. So we actually have questions from last time which I'm going to answer first. So I was asked if I could devote an episode on no oil to share, especially about its effect on cancer and multiple sclerosis and the coconut oil craze. So not a doctor, don't pretend to be, I'm gonna leave that to the doctor, doctors, you know, prevent and reverse heart disease, forks over knives, there's so much information. Dr. McDougall's website, he does a great YouTube, it's free on his website about multiple sclerosis and the research he did at Oregon State University where he reversed it with the McDougall diet. So I'm not going to talk about that as far as health and cancer because I really am not qualified to do that. But what I can talk about is oil and its effect on weight, which we know is astronomical. You talked about coconut oil, the coconut oil craze, and my favorite line from the wonderful recent documentary, Eating You Alive, is when Dr. Evan Allen of Las Vegas said that the only thing about the coconut oil miracle that he understands is that it's a miracle that people actually buy it and eat it. You know, oil is 4,000 calories a pound. It has no fiber, it has no nutrients. It doesn't matter if it's coconut oil, olive oil, flaxseed oil, avocado oil, walnut oil. Oil is oil, fat is fat, and the fat you eat is the fat you wear. If there was anything that your body needed in the coconut oil, in the olive oil, wouldn't it be in the coconut or the olive or the nut? So if you're going to eat high fat foods, eat them in their whole food plant form, like nuts, seeds, and avocado. There's nothing magical that happens in the processing that turns a whole food into a processed food that gives you any of these beneficial compounds, if anything. It's the opposite, because when you process a food, you make it calorie rich and nutrient poor, and everything that was good about the whole food, the water, the fiber, the vitamins, the minerals, the phytochemicals and antioxidants are thrown away in the processing, and you're left with the non-nutritive disease promoting a part. And it, you know, coconut oil is probably worse because it's 92% saturated fat. It's higher in saturated fat than lard. But let's just forget about all the deleterious effects that oil has on your vasculature. It harms your endothelial, the life jacket of your circulatory system. It's atherogenic, obesogenic, and diabetogenic. Let's just pretend maybe it's not so bad or it's even good. The point is, is it's not good for weight loss. It's 4,000 calories per pound. There is no food on the planet that's as calorically dense. It's 40 times as calorically dense as vegetables, which are 100 calories a pound. And it does not facilitate weight loss in any way, shape, or form. When people say, well, if I don't eat you know, oil or, or fat, I'm gonna be uh, you know, hungry, that, that's not true. If you eat enough calories of whole, low-fat whole food plants, you're gonna be satiated, and what leads to satiation are complex carbohydrates, like the potatoes, the rice, the beans, not the oil, I promise. But you'll like it, because the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released, and since most of you aren't eating for hunger and survival, but for stress or anger or loneliness or depression or anxiety, you want these foods of a high caloric density, so you'll feel better in your medicating in your brain. Yeah, Kenny, you have So a the question, question is, from Christina, 
Is it possible to still have high cholesterol in a plant-based diet? Absolutely. So there's a lot of cholesterol that's genetic, and I wouldn't worry so much about the number as I would worry about what your diet is. The thing is, is as people are losing weight, believe it or not, their cholesterol often goes up because you're eating your body's own fat, which is high cholesterol. So it absolutely is. But I would also say, how much fat are you eating? How many nuts and seeds, you know, an avocado? It is very difficult to have very high cholesterol on the low fat or no added fat version of the plant-based diet, but some people do. And again, Dr. Esselstyn talks a lot about this, that he doesn't worry so much about the number if you're eating the diet. That's what's gonna make the difference, not the number. And how, what, what is hers? Does she know? Is she, can she post it? Uh, no, I don't see it okay. yet. Because they say that you know, under 150, you're bulletproof against heart disease. But you know, yes, there is a genetic component for sure, but the diet is what's going to pull the trigger. Your genetics only loads the gun. So. Someone says you were on earlier today, so this is second time yeah, for well, Shirley to I, see you. Well, hi, Shirley, but Shirley, that wasn't Weight Loss Wednesday. I broadcasted just to the Ultimate Weight Loss people. So yes, yeah, same outfit. It gotcha. Could, it could, very confusing. I should have probably changed my shirt. So Jessica wants to know if when I go to a veg fest, if I go around the booths and eat all the samples, she says she feels sad about changing old behaviors because it's fun to eat and get that dopamine effect. Can I have a pep talk? Well, join UWL already and I'll give you a pep talk every single day because I'm always talking to these guys, either visually or typing it. So when I go to a veg fest, do I go around the booths and eat all the samples? So I do go around all the booths, but I don't eat any of the samples because I don't eat if I'm not hungry. And I guess if I was hungry, I might, but I generally don't graze or snack. And generally, veg fests are crap fests, which is why I really get invited because it's their, you know, the donut festival, the cupcake festival, the lunch truck festival. I don't think I've ever been to a veg fest yet that actually served whole food without oil or sugar, oil and salt. And I understand they're there to get more people interested in a plant-based diet and they, they serve their purpose, but I don't know if it's gonna really help you get healthy, especially if you suffer from food addiction, because when you're in an environment like that, it's pretty hard not to partake. I went to the OC Veg Fest yeah. and uh, I ate all that, some yeah, of the junk, some, some of the junk. I got sick, I was sick for yeah. a couple if days. Like, healthy, it's really, really hard. One guy didn't wear gloves or oh something happened, God. I don't know. No, I think it was all the oil, Kenny, you're not used to it. So, so I do go around the booths, mostly just to look at products like t-shirts and things like that. And if I see the food, I generally avoid it because it's like Costco. There's really nothing you can eat at a veg fest if you're healthy. So, you know, yes, it's fun to eat, but it's also fun to eat healthy food like Japanese sweet potato fries made in the air fryer or potato waffles like I had for lunch that were crisper than any French Those are fun. you can imagine with applesauce and onions. So it can still be fun to eat on the diet that I recommend. And as far as that dopamine effect, I'm wearing my earrings that Tim gave me that are the chemical symbol for dopamine. Always remind me to get my dopamine places other than the refrigerator. So if you want more dopamine, then get it in healthy ways. If you want feel good brain chemicals, how much sex are you having? How much exercise are you doing? You know. Uh, there's ways to get it without medicating with food. And I get it, because a lot of people are stressed, they're born with low D2 receptivity, there's addiction in their family, and they just don't produce enough dopamine. So do things to feel good in, with your life instead of just with your food. How much volunteer work do you do? You know, I find that maybe it's not dopamine, I don't know all the neurotransmitters, serotonin, nor, nor I, you know, I just, oxytocin, whatever, I don't, I'm not a brain scientist, but I do know there's ways to feel good in life without food. I mean, and food should be pleasurable, and it is pleasurable, but there's ways you can feel really good. And if you're not moving your body, if you're not meditating, if you're not doing anything for humanity like volunteer work, then all you're gonna have to get your dopamine is food. But I don't recommend going to crap fests if you're gonna eat the food. Mary asks, well then how do you get your dopamine um Fix. <laughs> How do you get you fixed? Well, I, I, I mean. Oh, you said the sex and all those well, other well, things. Well, here's yeah. the thing. I, you know, again, I, you know, I don't know which brain chemicals are which, but how do I feel good in life? I have strong spiritual connections. I start my day with meditation and prayer. I have a, a dog that I love very much named Bailey that I spend a lot of time with, petting, kissing, hugging, walking. I exercise every day. I'm out in the sunshine. So I use my life as a way to feel good in my activities. I help people, I do volunteer work. You know, I think if you guys would just start helping other people and stop being so focused on yourself and your body weight and your diet and weighing yourself, do, what are you doing in the world? What are you doing in the world? And I don't mean your job, but I really believe everyone should do volunteer work. I, I mean, I think that should be like, 
like you can't even live even on Bailey property. does volunteer you know, work. Bailey does too, but but you know volunteer work is the John Pierre says is the rent that you pay for the privilege of living on Earth. And when I graduated Cal State Northridge in 1995, your alma mater, right, Kenny? Yeah, uh, 94. Our graduation speaker spoke in sign language. It was Marlene Matlin, and she said the onus is on all of us graduates to do volunteer work. And I never didn't do volunteer work because when you help other people that's how you feel good you know mother teresa true she's a saint she was a saint but don't you think one of the reasons she administered to minister to all those lepers was because it actually made her feel good you know get outside of yourself do some good for the world and you'll get plenty of feel good brain chemicals without food well as you dog down veg fest yeah. i'll put it some positive because yeah. colleen was there yeah. and she went to veg fest right. and she had aj samples right. so there that's might right. be aj yeah. samples there and i would recommend for the veg fest which is coming up at the end of this month yeah. april right. 30th there are some positive things forget all the food yeah. trucks and all that stuff that might be cause you sickness whatever right. whatever right. but there are those animals there right. are Absolutely. people giving some positive things and you might find a charity or something you might be interested right. in getting involved so I'd go just for that you, know, you should go and I apologize <laughs> to all the veg fest out there that never hired me for saying that I just <laughs> wish you guys would have some healthy food but I go to the LA veg fest is April 30th Woodley Park 10 30 to 6 I mean there's great t-shirts there's great buttons there's like-minded people there's books like you say there's animals to adopt just stay away from the crap if it's yeah. gonna be a problem for and you don't have to go to the beer garden and have That's beer right. you Absolutely. can go to the beer garden and have dancing and right. music and stuff like that Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kenny, for uh, bringing me back down to... Go VegFest Park. LA. Yeah. Billy's so, doing a fantastic job making this happen this year. Right. So, yeah, that's... Uh, you know, they, they, I don't recognize one speaker. They're doing all these young people that are social media stars that I've never heard of any of them. So there's not one person in the plant-based world that's speaking. I, but Dr. Bernard, I think. So that should be interesting. Okay, we're all too old now, Kenny. Jan, Not that old yet. Yeah, according to VegFest, we are. Jan says that I should use one of my weight loss Wednesdays to work through the myths of vegetarian and veganism and weight loss and address how some people think that if they are only eating chicken and fish, they are vegetarian. Well, first of all, if you're eating chicken and fish or chicken or fish, you're not vegetarian at all because they're not vegetables. So I don't know how to go through that myth. That's just a fact. You're just not vegetarian if you're eating chicken and fish. So. As far as the myths about veganism and weight loss, well, it's true that you can be very slender on a plant-based diet or you can be very obese, and I've been both, and I prefer being slender. You know, uh, one of my friends, extraordinary chef Del Sroof, who wrote Better Than Vegan, weighed, I believe, over 500 pounds on a vegan diet. So it depends what comprises the vegan diet because you can comprise an extremely unhealthy vegan diet of junk food, of soda and french fries and, and vegan pastries with sugar and flour and oil, or you can eat a whole food plant-based diet with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and maybe a little bit of nuts and seeds and avocado if you, if you can afford those calorically and be very slender. So, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people get upset that there are healthy vegans, like the ethical vegans. I, I hate that, the, again, this is the other thing, Kenny, because the veg fest tend to be more like in the ethical realm. And if you're a healthy vegan, you gotta kinda get your nose, they look down your nose at them. I've had ethical vegans tell me, well, if you're not vegan for the animals, you shouldn't be vegan. When in fact, I became vegan for the animals 40 years ago. You don't stay vegan for 40 years if you're just doing it for yourself. I was very, very unhealthy and was 200 pounds with the beginning of colon cancer from my very, very unhealthy, vegan diet but what's interesting is like when i spoke at farm sanctuary i said the last time i checked the animals don't care why we're not eating them so there's no bad reason to be vegan whether it's for the health the environment the animals are all three because when you are vegan you're you're affecting all three you know i think about it when i grew up i went to a Akiba, I went to the yeshiva, I went to uh, like parochial school for Jewish people, Orthodox day school, where the first half of the day was Orthodox and the second half was... I didn't know uh, was, you yeah, were that I did, religious. Was English. And so we were not Orthodox Jews, we were conservative, but I went to this Orthodox school and the Orthodox Jews at the time at my school seemed to kind of look down on the conservative Jews and they seemed to kind of look down on the reformed Jews, which you know, we should be embracing any differences because if, it, you know, especially we're in the same religion, and I find the same thing in veganism, not that it's a religion, it can be to some people, is that the, the, the little factions don't get along so well. And so I, I wish there was a way to, you know, uh, <laughs> Will Tuttle would be a good one for that, you know, World Peace Diet because he's healthy and he's ethical. John Pierre is another example. You know, in, I mean, there, there's two, I don't want to say there's infighting, but the reality is, is people don't want um, us to be promoting veganism as a weight loss thing necessarily. It, 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 what the heck? You, 
Kenny, you watching it while we're talking? I'm trying to find the rest of the question okay. someone wrote that oh, I couldn't sometimes. see online. On yeah. the, on the... Guys, sometimes what happens is, because this is an iPhone 5, it's really small, and you can only see literally three lines, and it goes really, really fast. So Becky said something, I can't yeah, read it. I'm trying to figure that question. out. You know, please, please type it again. But anyway, you know, I'm not sure what myth you mean other than it, it, a vegan diet is not a guarantee of health or weight loss, but it can be both if you follow the correct version of it. So this is just a really quick question from Sherry. Wants to know if she doesn't eat salt, where will she get her iodine? So I don't eat salt or I rarely eat it and I get it from uh, Dulce. I prefer the smoked Dulce. They are actually out of it at Maine Coast Sea Vegetables right now or whatever that's called. Maine, yeah, Maine Coast Sea Vegetables. But So I just ordered some on Etsy. Uh, this stuff is really, really delicious. I, how much you need, I don't know. I would ask your doctor or Go to Nutrition Facts, nutrition facts with an S.org, Dr. Michael Greger's wonderful comprehensive website. Hey, Kenny, did you see that thing that Dr. Greger tweeted that the Dalai Lama endorsed this book? It was so cool. I and, missed it. Yeah, very, very cool if you follow Dr. Greger. Congratulations, not that you'll watch it, but that was very extraordinary. And so um, if sea vegetables are delicious. They taste salty because they are from the sea, but they have very little sodium in them. And so that's where we get them. And they're quite good. They're good by themselves. They're good with vegetables. All right. Keep going, Kenny, or anything you got something for me? I'm trying to find I couldn't find it, so now I'm going to go All back right. and see what well, we have. Maybe they'll post again. Okay, so, um, so I'm sorry, I don't have your name on this, not because it was anonymous. We haven't had dinner about. yet, Marie. Yeah, this is not, you guys, please type in, and by the way, please always feel free to share these if you like them. There's a share button. Do you guys like this time? Because I feel like I'm just kind of dragging. It's so late. I mean, not that <laughs> someone's just wondering how you have so much energy really? and you have so much That's live. That's so funny because <laughs> I get up around 5:30 and I feel like I, I, I. It's not that I miss 2 p.m., but I'm thinking like at 3 p.m. Kenny, I was chomping at the bit, ready to go. Well, a lot of people so, are 7 o'clock right now yes, for a lot of people, seven, and they're excited seven. to be here because they're usually not no, able I, to catch us. I understand, us. but I'm thinking maybe an hour earlier might be good. So like, we're out. This, this is my normal. Uh, three o'clock, six o'clock East Whatever. Coast time. We'll do our best. So they got an air fryer, use it several times daily, and started making air fry oil-free plantains, both green and ripe. Do you think these are a good source of starch for a meal or considered Sounds a fruit? Sounds sweet. My goal is weight loss. So I didn't know the answer to that, so I looked it up, and I also asked Dr. Goldhammer, and he said plantains are actually a fruit, but they're a starchy fruit. So their caloric density is about 550 calories a pound, which is a lot higher than your average fruit because certain fruits like the non-starchy fruits like tomato, zucchini, bell pepper, okra, eggplant, and uh, tomato, zucchini, eggplant, okra, zucchini, and cucumber. These are 67 calories per pound and most fruits are around 200 calories a pound like apples and berries. Bananas are about 400 calories a pound. Cherries about 300. So it's it's much higher in caloric density than other fruits. The only fruit that's higher in caloric density would be avocados, which are 750 calories a pound. So it is more calorically dense. When it gets sweet, then it's less starchy, and I believe it, it's the caloric density lowers slightly. You know, cooking it is it, it's you can't really eat them raw, to my understanding, and so. I don't want to say I worry about the air fryer now because here I am recommending it, but now what's happening is like now that my air fryer is not here anymore and missing it so bad because I got so used to eating like delicious french fries every day for lunch and it's like now I don't have it and I'm kind of jon not not going through withdrawal, but I'm jonesing for it. And I think if we if we air fry everything, then we don't ever eat stuff the other way anymore. But I would vary your starch. I mean, are you eating this every day? How are you eating it? Are you eating, if you want to lose weight, are you just eating starch? Or are you eating it with vegetables? Because you want to make sure that you're eating at least half your plate visually, if not more, in non-starchy vegetables to lower the caloric density of the whole meal. I don't think there's anything wrong with eating plantains. They serve them at True North, and they often serve them, on, I, I mean, they make this lasagna where that's actually the top. They serve them f often for breakfast. I mean, they're delicious. So, you know, I, you know, I worry about like, I don't want to say I worry about it, but I don't generally cook fruit because anytime you cook anything, you're increasing the caloric density because you're removing the water. So while I often roast vegetables, I very rarely roast fruit. I roast grapes occasionally for a certain recipe and use them maybe as a topping for banana soft serve. But I think that when you roast things, you're concentrating the sugars, you're making it sweeter, which can be a good thing, but it makes it easier to overeat on. And so I don't know how far you are with your weight loss journey. You know. When you have a lot of weight to lose, you have a little bit more 
leeway to eat some of these richer things not that that's rich i mean i think it's fine but i again i would vary your starch the starch you know it's funny because this this leads into another question from kayla that says why are oats bad for breakfast if they serve them at true north well it's not that oats are bad at all it's not that any starch is bad it's just that certain starches are higher in caloric density so legumes beans peas lentils split peas are 550 to 600 calories a pound whereas whole grains like rice, quinoa, teff, millet, amaranth, corn are about 500 calories a pound, and sweet potatoes, potatoes, winter squashes like kabocha, etc., are about 350 calories per pound. So it's not that one starch is bad and one starch is good, it's just that lower caloric density. And so I asked Dr. Goldhammer, uh, you know, because so many people, especially when they come to Ultimate Weight Loss and they are so resistant to eating vegetables in general and vegetables for breakfast in in particular and they just want to eat their fruits and oats which which I say is not a great idea because you want to start your day in a savory way not with cake and the oats are the flour and the the fruit is the sugar and so I asked him about that and he said there's nothing wrong with eating fruits and oats if you're trying to gain weight or maintain weight stabilize weight but if you're trying to lose weight then that is not your best breakfast your best breakfast is vegetables or vegetables with some winter squashes and sweet potatoes and by the way Kayla that's not all they serve at True North they make oats in water and then they make another one that is got half water and half unsweetened apple juice but they serve the 24-hour salad bar at breakfast at True North that's what they want you to eat and that's sort of like you know your little treat or garnish and they also serve steamed vegetables for breakfast at True North and steamed squash so it, it, that's one of the choices that's the most calorically dense choice at breakfast and now they're serving other savory breakfast Dr. Goldhammer told me yesterday like a potato hash made with lentils and spinach so I think savory breakfasts are best for people that are food addicts in general and sugar addicts in particular and I think vegetables for breakfast are the best thing you can do because if you start your day in the most savory and nutrient dense way the rest of the day everything's going to taste amazing any questions Kenny or should I go on to the last couple of questions well, go ahead. Uh, Vic, there was someone from Victoria, Australia, saying it's 9:20 a.m. in the morning. Ooh, wow, so wow, wow. We're okay. a little behind for them, okay. but uh, it's 9:20 tomorrow, right? I guess. Yeah, it couldn't couldn't be yesterday, could it? Okay, could so this is so interesting. And I, guys, I, I usually don't get the questions until like an hour before, but I'm so glad Charles gave them to me early because I spent hours on the phone researching this question. So Jody said that she used to use Table Tasty, that's a salt-free seasoning made by Benson's Gourmet Seasoning. But then I learned that citric acid can be addicting and Table Tasty has that ingredient, so I stopped eating. What are my views on that? Now, um, so I asked her where she heard that and she said it was from a blogger. And I said, well, what medical school did the blogger go to? If you go to Dr. Greger's website, and he did go to medical school, nutritionfacts.org, and you put citric acid in the search box, he says that citric acid is harmless. Now, I took this to other experts. I contacted Mark Schatzker, who wrote The Dorito Effect, who is not a fan of food additives at all. The whole book is about that. And I called Debbie Benson, the creator of Table Tasty, and I called another company that I will tell you about right now. So, this is Table Tasty, and this is my favorite salt-free seasoning because it doesn't have black pepper. Yes, it does have citric acid in it. And these are my favorite canned tomatoes, and these are made by Muir Glen. And they do have naturally derived citric acid in them. So I called the company, and I asked to talk to somebody in the science or whatever department, somebody that would know something about that, and I asked them what was the purpose of the citric acid, and et cetera. And, and this, what they said is basically the same thing that everybody said. Citric acid is used as a flavor enhancer but it's also used as a preservative. And if you're eating something that's not shelf stable, it's probably a good idea that there are some preservatives in there. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are jarred tomatoes you can get maybe that don't have citric acid in it. Now, if you, first of all, if it's a problem for you, just when in doubt, leave it out. So I'm not telling you to eat citric acid or you have to eat it. But when somebody tells you something is addictive or harmful, show me the evidence show me something in the medical literature show me that it is now the reality is is let's just say let's play devil's advocate and let's just say Benson stable tasty or, or the ingredient in it the citric acid is addictive well okay but so is salt and Jody you said that when you use salt you stuff yourself way more 
that, it, that, that that really leads to overeating, and that should tell you something right there. Now the other thing is, is let's just say citric acid is addicting. Well, the poison is in the dose, as Dr. Clapper says. How much are you using? So for example, a um, webinar coming up where I make my new favorite soup, my smoky butternut bisque, and the recipe calls for one and a half one, one half tablespoon, which is one and a half teaspoons of Benson's Table Tasty. That's gonna serve six people, so each person is getting a quarter teaspoon of Table Tasty. So, is that enough to set somebody off? Well, if it's enough to set you off, if you really believe that it, it is a problem for you, then you should always leave it out. But I think that anytime you're avoiding salt is probably a good thing for most people, especially if you have heart disease already, especially if you're overweight and trying to lose weight, because salt is definitely a trigger. It, it stimulates you to eat more food. If you find that Benson's is doing that, because we have another similar question where someone said, you make it sound like Benson's is bad for weight loss, putting on veggies, does it slow the process? Well, no, it's not so much that it slows the process, but here's the thing, any seasoning, you're gonna eat more. Anything that you do to make your food taste better or more hyper palatable or remove the water, you're going to eat more because that's the whole thing. When things are more calorically concentrated, there's more dopamine, there's more pleasure, you're going to eat more. And not everybody wants to eat raw salads and just steamed vegetables. And so we use these things to get people to eat more vegetables. People aren't using Benson's Table Tasty so that they can eat more dessert. They're generally using it so that they can eat foods that they don't really want to eat like vegetables. And so I think of it as something that can be useful in the transition and maybe even useful thereafter until you neuroadapt to the taste, the more bitter tastes of vegetables. Now if Benson's table tasting and citric acid was so bad, why is one of their biggest customers several major medical centers, like the Weimar Institute, like True North? You see, I know that Dr. Goldhammer personally is not a fan of it, but he is the most austere eater in the world and he's not a fan of anything. He's not a fan of nutritional yeast or pressure cooking or anything like that. But he has the luxury to get very sick people that are going to be compliant. He's not working with people that are in the real world. But Dr. Clapper gives it to people to, so that they can eat the vegetables. Now, there's many ways to make your vegetables or food taste good without Benson's Table Tasty. But then you kind of have to know how to cook a little bit. I can do it with, with, with herbs and I don't necessarily need that. I just happen to like it. I don't use it excessively. I have it in a few recipes. But then again, I have no problem just eating plain steamed vegetables either. So it, the thing is, is when I wrote Mark Schatzker, who wrote The Dorito Effect, who talked about how the food companies, the processed food companies, do these so-called natural flavors that are anything but to to get us to eat more, to trigger overeating. Citric acid has been around forever. And one of the reasons it's used in Table Tasty that Debbie Benson told me is because it's you're, you're balancing the flavors, the sour with the sweet, because you're trying to simulate salt. That's why Benson's tastes more like salt than any other salt-free seasoning. So it's not only being used as a preservative, but it is being used as a flavor enhancer because it has that salty quality that she's trying to replicate. I know her personally, she's a small company. She's, I believe they, a big company tried to buy her and she didn't want to do that because she didn't want to lose control. So she's not putting it in there to try to trick you to get you addicted to table tasty. I, I really respect her integrity with that and I don't think these tomato companies are doing that either because there's been citric acid in tomato products forever and the obesity rates are not because people are having canned tomatoes with citric acid, it's not that. Again, as I said, if it's a problem for you, if anything is a trigger for you, when in doubt, obviously leave it out. So when I asked Mark Shasker, he said that he didn't think that in the products I was mentioning, like spice blends and tomatoes, that the citric acid was in a problem, was a problem. But when it appears in foods like candy, like beverages, then they're doing it in there to purposely get you to eat more. So I hope that helps. Anything more, Kenny, before I go on to the final question. Everyone's making their comments on Table Tasty, okay. and uh, yeah. that's okay. I mean, yeah. mm. you don't have to use it. I get nothing from Debbie Benson. You get 10% off if you might use my name, Chef AJ. You know, this gets into the whole concept of one of the questions we had a couple weeks ago, which is, is it better to go 100% or is it better to kind of, you know, lean in and dip your toe? You know, if you can just 
do the most health promoting diet from where you are right now, do it. But a lot of people do need these baby steps. They need to, need to transition. And sometimes you put the training wheels on the bike before you ride and things like Benson's Table Tasty could be useful. That said, if there's any ingredient or any product or any food, even a healthy food, that does not work for you, there is no one food or product you have to have, not even my beloved Instant Pot or Air Fryer. And that's why when they say, well, you have to eat nuts, well, no, you don't. There is always a way to get what you need in a different way. So if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work for everybody. And you know, to say citric acid's addictive, I wanna see the medical research on that because you know what, alcohol is addictive too. But not everybody that drinks becomes an alcoholic and not everybody that ingests citric acid has that response. You know, I had mentioned, I can't remember if it was on this broadcast or on my teleclass, how when I accidentally had sugar and my accident, Charles brought the, bought the wrong almond milk and we usually don't use box, but we were on vacation in Big Bear and the box of the unsweetened vanilla and the regular looked the same and I was making the banana fluff in the blender just with the Vitamix, just like a half a cup of almond milk with frozen bananas just to have for our dessert. And we have it every, well, I don't have it so much now, but one of the big bears, like we have it every night. And I was eating it and I go, oh my God, this is like the best ever, it must be the mountain air. And I went to go make some more and I never do that. And then when I went, this time I looked and there was actually sugar in the box and I didn't know that. And so for me, that did perpetuate overeating. And I didn't even know it, but yet last week when I had my laryngitis, I had two cough drops that had sugar and, you know, I was fine. So sometimes the poison is in the dose and maybe it depends what else you're eating. And again, you, please feel free to avoid anything that concerns you and uh, hopefully we've laid that puppy to rest. Okay, Kenny, keep going. We're going. All right. So this is an interesting question. Why does it seem that a limited and measured amount of avocado, dates, and some salt on the surface of my food after it's cooked helps me avoid what I consider worse, processed foods, dairy, sugar, flour, oils, and helps me avoid nuts and coconut. In a sense, it seems that my brain or body still needs some amount of plant fat, sugar, salt to stay in check. Well, that's a very interesting concept. And if you believe it, I believe it, but I have a hard time believing this. And what your question reminded me of is a friend of mine who um, is a nurse and she works the night shift. She works uh, 11 to 7 and she leaves for work at 10.30, kisses her husband goodnight and goes to work. And she had a flat tire on the way to work and it was very close to a friend's house and she didn't want to disturb her husband because she knew she, he was probably already asleep or going to sleep. So she had the friend drive her home, back home, and she was going to use the husband's car because he didn't have to be at work until after she got home. And so this lady is a, was a beautiful lady. She was a modest lady from another culture, and this lady just, just didn't like pornography, which is her right. I'm not a fan of it either. I'm not here to discuss the efficacy of pornography, but she clearly didn't like it, and she, her husband knew how she felt about the magazines and things like that. So she caught home and instead of asleep, she found her husband on the couch, pleasuring himself in an interactive manner with the computer. And uh, you're probably saying, what does this have to do with sugar oil and so I'm gonna tell you in a second, there's a method to my madness and a point to the story. And she was hurt and shocked and bewildered. And uh, she found upon investigation that this was not a one-time event, that this is kind of how he spent his evenings. And he said to her that, you know, she shouldn't be so upset because in doing this, it prevented him from stepping outside the marriage and cheating on her and having sex with an actual woman. And so when I looked at your question, it, like as you were saying, well, if I do something that's um, a little bit bad, it's gonna prevent me from doing something less bad instead of just trying to strive for what is best. And just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. And I, it's, it's, to me, it's like um, rationalization, like this man saying, well, I'm, I'm going to engage in this interactive pornography so that I don't do something worse, like have an affair. Well, why not just, you know, not do either? I would say that if you really, really believe this, it's true for you. But I would also say that if you really could do an experiment where you could comply for the 30 days that it really takes to get off the salt, you may find you not you don't need it so that you don't eat less bad things. To me, that sounds like an addiction talking because that would be like somebody that's an alcoholic saying, well, you know, I need to have like one drink a day. I need to have one beer a day so that I don't binge on alcohol. Well, 
if you're an alcoholic, the idea is, is that you want no alcohol. And if you're a food addict, these high fat plant foods, these, these salt, these are chemicals that you're adding to the food that can fool your brain satiety mechanisms that perpetuate overeating. So I don't think it's a good thing. You know, if you go to True North and fast, you're not getting any added fat, any added sugar, any added salt, and people neuro adapt very quickly, and then the taste of whole natural food appeals to them. I don't know how much of the dried fruit, the avocado and the salt you're eating, but my feeling is, is that as long as you're eating any of it, you're keeping those tastes alive and you're constantly teasing yourself into wanting more. And that's why I think that if you could do a prolonged experiment, by prolonged I mean like, you know, I don't know what's the longest you've gone, but you say that if you don't eat these things, then you want these other things more. Am I understanding that correctly? And to me, that is a rationalization and not necessarily true. When I've asked Dr. Goldhammer about this, he says that there's no evidence that elimination leads to participation. To me, that's the addiction talking, saying, well, if I don't have it, I'm gonna want it more. I'll give an example of this. You know, my husband, Charles, is not a food addict. He's slender. And when he found out that he had atrial fibrillation or at an atrial flutter, this is something he's had congenitally since birth, but it was never diagnosed. They said he had anxiety, and he's like the calmest man I've ever met. But finally, a doctor found him, converted him. He was the only time he was hospitalized in our 22-year marriage. And so when he got out of the hospital, he had to go to a cardiologist. And one of the, the cardiologists was thrilled with his diet. That was the diet the cardiologist wanted him to be on. He wanted him to up his exercise, but he wrote a prescription that day. It said, no caffeine, alcohol, or chocolate. Now, my husband didn't drink coffee, so that wasn't a problem. He drank alcohol a couple times a year at a wedding or a bar mitzvah, but he loved chocolate. And we were apartment managers at the time, and every day at three o'clock, our job got really stressful, and we'd make something called the caramel fakeado. It's a delicious recipe from unprocessed that's made with dates and raw cacao powder. And he'd have this, this vegan chocolate every day at night, and so he was having chocolate every day. And so when the doctor told him that he could not have any chocolate anymore, he kind of went, Okay. Now, you know, he, he wasn't like celebrating, but very, but it wasn't a big deal to him. And, you know, if somebody said to you, and I'm using okra as example, because not, it's not usually a food that's craved. And if I said to you that you will be thin and happy and disease free the rest of your life, if you just don't eat any more okra, most people would say, okay, I won't eat okra. But the problem is, is when we say these other foods, these high fat foods, the salt, the sugars, that kind of thing, that's how you know it's an addictive food for you, the fact that you can't do without it. And I think that until you do without it, you don't know that you can't do without it because by keeping in even these small amounts at these very low levels, that is just teasing you and, and, and it's, it's making you want more because all these things are appetite stimulants. So that's what I say about that. And uh, that's all I have for today unless somebody else has any questions that's watching live. Someone was asking about, uh, you know, what do you have for breakfast? But that's another video we've done. Well, in the past. you know, I have so many um, of these free things. videos on my website, eatonprocess.com. There's a webinar page, and yes, six of them have a small fee because they take hours for Gustavo to fly in from Dallas and shoot and edit, but about six of them are completely free. And as a matter of fact, we have a free one coming up on Sunday, April 30th at 6 p.m., so it'll be interactive. It's a plant-based dinner party, and so you can learn how to make a meal that I actually make for company. It's a Mexican lasagna. It's a four-layer ice cream cake. It's cheese and crackers and it's smoked artichokes. It's completely free, but you do have to register. I'll provide the link and, that, and you can watch it live with me and I answer questions in real time. Yes, there is a replay, but you still have to register to get the replay. But on the webinar page, I show, I think it's called A Day in the Life of Chef AJ, what I eat in a day, what I eat in a week, uh, easy meals to make you thin, easy meals to keep you thin. So there's a lot of things, but basically, I eat the same thing every day, guys, and so does Bailey, and we're both, happy and healthy and at our perfect weight you know variety is great as far as you know uh, nutrients and changing my fruits and vegetables but in general variety is the kiss of death for somebody that's a food addict because you experience something called sensory specific satiety let me give you an example so uh, when I was at True North I think it was the second time there was a lovely cooking instructor named Lori Wood who made this meal that we call the potato meal now where she just had 
baked potatoes, large russet potatoes, and she stuffed it. If you guys could see how cute Kenny and Bailey is, she had a bath today. You can turn the camera on you to show Bailey just for a second if you mm -hmm. want. So she made these too. russet potatoes, delicious, baked in the oven, and she stuffed it with corn and beans and a little bit of guacamole that she made out of beans instead of avocado, and there was some salsa. And it was this just luscious, delicious meal that we eat many times a week, and it's probably like maybe 400 calories. It's completely filling and satiating. And so we ate that and we were like, oh, this is so good. This is delicious. We're going to make this at home. And so then she said, she goes, would anybody like another potato? And everybody's like, oh, no, we're too full. She goes, well, how about just a little pea? Oh, no, we're too full. So she goes in the kitchen. She brings out this huge carrot cake. And she goes, who would like a piece of carrot cake? And all 40 hands shot up. You see, so that's the idea about variety, you know, because when you can only eat a certain much of, of a certain food, but then when you start adding more and more options, it just makes it so easy to overeat, which is why when we have potlucks, even if they're compliant, or Thanksgiving dinner, when there's more choices, you're just gonna eat more food. So I keep it real simple, no more than two things. I should say if it's a salad, it's got lots of things in it, but that's a little different. But I mean, it's, it's vegetables and starch, and that's what I eat at every meal. So I start every meal with a pound of vegetables, and then I eat another pound with the starch. So my day generally looks like I wake up between 5.30 and 6.30 in the morning, I meditate for a half hour, it takes me a while to get Bailey's breakfast, Charles's breakfast, Charles's lunch, cook my vegetables, walk Bailey for an hour, and on days that I don't spin, I spin three days a week, 90 minute classes, Tuesday, Thursday, and either Saturday or Sunday. But on days that I don't spin, I generally don't get hungry until 1 p.m. I'm doing what's known as intermittent fasting without intending to, but the truth is, is really, I don't get hungry until 1 p.m. And my advice to you, whether you're struggling with weight or not, is don't eat when you're not hungry. You know, it's a novel concept, eat when hungry, stop when full, but if we never ate outside the demands of true hunger, we'd never be overweight. So when I'm hungry, I've already cooked my vegetables, by the way, because if I wait till I'm hungry, then I look at the oatmeal and fruit that I always have a big bowl of for Charles in the fridge, or I look at those ripe bananas or the cooked sweet potatoes, and I want that. So I cook my vegetables. The minute I wake up, I undercook them and put them in this little sealed thing that they're gonna stay warm. And then when I'm hungry, I eat my vegetables, which is a minimum of two pounds. It's, we're doing a 14 day greens challenge right now in Ultimate Weight Loss, but usually it's I love squash, I love the yellow and the green zucchini, so I'll eat that. And then I wait till hunger returns. Now sometimes it returns in 20 minutes, but some days if I'm just sitting at the computer typing, it might be an hour or two hours. So then when I'm hungry again, I eat a nice big serving of starch, a minimum of 24 ounces, that's a pound and a half after cooking, of some kind of potatoes. Today was potato waffles, yesterday was Hannah yams, and I'll eat that with another pound of non-starchy vegetables. Usually it's broccoli, sometimes it's cauliflower, I switch that up a little bit. Then when hunger returns, because I'm gonna be walking Bailey for an hour, but sometimes I don't get dinner till seven, because that's when Charles gets home, then I'll eat another pound of vegetables, this time raw. So usually it's purple carrots, it's jicama, things like that, and then for dinner, again, it's starch and vegetables. So sometimes it's the huge salad I showed you in the video of the eight secrets to superior salad satisfaction, where the salad has starch in it, like wild rice or brown rice, or I might have one of my soups, smoky butternut bisque, with wild rice or brown rice, and uh, that's it, vegetables, starch, vegetables, starch. And do I eat fruit? Well, I'm always eating the fruity vegetables, but if I feel like I need a treat, I'll have some fruit. But I don't eat a lot of fruit because as a recovering sugar addict, fruit has now become my candy, and I could eat five bananas, and that's not such a good thing. So yeah, I, I save fruit for the end of the day to, as my sweet treat. Some days maybe I don't eat any sweet fruit. Some days I eat one or two pieces, and that's what I do. Uh, eat, rinse, repeat, and it's, it really works for me. Even Dr. McDougall, who's not overweight or a food addict, says him and Mary eat the same thing every day too. It really works, simplicity is the key. Stop chasing recipes, start eating food. So as we wrap this up, AJ, let's talk about where are you gonna be speaking in the next week, Gosh, this week? you know, I'm home for a while, guys. Actually, um, my book is edited, and the first draft is being uh, reviewed on Saturday with the editor, and so I'm staying home to finish that. Where am I gonna be speaking? Well, I just spake, sp spake, that's past sense of spoke, at the Orange County Meetup, that's on this page. If you wanna see the lecture I gave last week, it's, it's very good, it's only about 30 minutes. So what's coming up? Let's see, my 40th high school reunion, I don't think I'll be speaking there, but I'll be going to, I'll be going to that. Um, May 7th is my cooking class, that's sold out. You know, I don't think I'm speaking anywhere until May 18th, it's a private event in Hilton Head, South Carolina. But if you live near South Carolina, I will be speaking at a 
open to the public event at remedyfood.org in November for Benji Kurtz. And uh, let's see, where else am I going? Las Vegas coming up. Las Wanna Vegas. Mention that? I'll be at the Health Healing Happiness. I'm not a speaker, but I'm going as a participant. Ina Mohan's wonderful event at the Tuscany, June, I believe it's 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, boy. What about that September event? September event. Oh, my God. Ultimate Weight Loss Live. Yes. Dr. Perry Saunders, Dr. Doug Lyle, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, myself, and John Pierre. September 1st, 2nd, 3rd at the Tuscany. So, yeah, I'm trying to stay home more, guys, because I really like it. Like Dorothy said, there's no place like home. So, if you aren't in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program and we are doing a Eat Your Greens, Fit Into Your Skinny Jeans Challenge right now, please consider joining us. And without further ado... With that, we need to get you a pair of jeans. I know. I don't like jeans. I have I jeans. I know. Leggings. So thanks, guys. Uh, sorry I missed last week. We'll be back next week. We might do it an hour earlier, but we'll announce it depending on our schedule. And thank you so much for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body you deserve. But you got to eat your greens.